This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We begin today's show in Burma, where the military seized power Monday in a coup, ousting the de facto leader Aung San Suu Kyi. Earlier today, Burmese police charged the former Nobel Peace Prize laureate, as well as Burma's deposed president, U Win Myint. Hundreds of lawmakers, activists and human rights defenders have also been detained since Monday's coup. Telecommunications had been cut in parts of Burma, which the military calls Myanmar. On Tuesday night, opponents of the coup protested by banging pots and pans outside their windows in Yangon. Reuters reports staff at 70 hospitals and medical departments in 30 towns across Burma stopped work today to protest the military. On Tuesday, the Biden administration formally declared the military's action to be a coup, prompting a review of U.S. foreign assistance to Burma. Monday's coup unfolded hours before lawmakers were to take their seats in the opening of parliament, following a November election in which the military made unsubstantiated claims of fraud. In the election, Aung San Suu Kyi Xi's party won over 80 percent of the contested seats in the Burmese parliament. Aung San Suu Kyi spent years fighting against the Burmese military, winning the Nobel Peace Prize in 1991 for her efforts. She spent 15 years under house arrest before becoming Burma's de facto civilian leader in 2016. But in recent years, she's been condemned for presiding over a campaign of violence by Burma's military against the minority Rohingya Muslim community, which saw over one million Rohingya flee to neighboring Bangladesh. Many displaced Rohingya fear the coup will make it impossible for them to return home. This is Mohammed Salam speaking from the refugee camp in Cox's Bazar. Now in Myanmar, the military have declared a one-year state of emergency. That announcement is not good for the Rohingya people, too, because the military, together with the Rakhine people, tortured us a lot and carried out genocide. Then they made us homeless. We are now away from our home in Bangladesh, living under tents. Where is our children's education? There is nothing here for us. Now their military governs again. There are no benefits for us. They have arrested the democratic leader with military force. The fact they arrested such a leader would not be good for the Rohingya people there. To talk more about the coup in Burma, we're joined by Mang Zarni, a Burmese scholar, dissident and human rights activist living in exile in Britain. He's co-founder of the Free Rohingya Coalition, as well as the Forces of Renewal for Southeast Asia, or FORSI, a grassroots network of pro-democracy scholars and human rights activists across Southeast Asia. Mang Zarni, thanks so much for being with us. Um, start off by talking about what happened this week. Talk about what unfolded in Burma. The country that the military calls Myanmar. Well, the military decided that uh, uh, they could no longer play this democracy game with Aung San Suu Kyi after two election cycles, uh, you know, starting 2015 and November 2022, and uh, uh, expect to beat Aung San Suu Kyi. So basically, what happened was that the military uh, is, uh, you know, uh, completely outfoxed uh, legally as well as, uh, you know, it, uh, at the poll. So that's why the military decided to wreck the game. And uh, what is interesting is what trick, you know, uh, there are personal factors that trigger uh, this coup uh, on Monday. The commander in chief. A May Online has a price tag on his head because he is named uh, one of the uh, criminal or, or basically number one criminal against uh, uh, humanity with respect to uh, Rohingya genocide. And so that's one reason. And the, the other one is, of course, you know, the they saw what happened on January 6th, uh, the, the storming of the U.S. Capitol, and they saw what is going on in China, Russia. The ideological climate moving towards the far right around the world emboldened the generals that this is the time 
to end this democracy game with Aung San Suu Kyi. So can you talk about the U.S. response? You have um, President Biden issuing a statement where he refers to Burma, not Myanmar, as President Obama also did, referred to Burma. Uh, and the issue of whether to call it a coup d'etat. On Monday, Biden uh, said the U.S. is, quote, taking note of those who stand with the people of Burma in this difficult hour and urged the international community to pressure the Burmese military to relinquish power, lift restrictions on communications and free all officials and activists who've been detained. He also suggested the U.S. may again impose sanctions on Burma. And, of course, if they call it a coup d'etat, it would require that they cut off aid to Burma. Yes, I think the call—you're designating uh, the coup uh, as, as coup, as should, it should be, uh, obviously automatically trigger immediate freezing of aid, but it's not a lot. I think, like, over $100 U.S. million uh, in the development or civil society aid or humanitarian aid to Burma. But I think, that, you know, I think we should also, uh, uh, you know, not forget the fact that the United States has, in some ways, contributed to this situation. You know, in 2010, uh, when the, U the Burmese military decided to play ball with the Western democracies. They brought in this essentially a very limited form of democracy where the military generals play regions uh, to the uh, civilian uh, Demo Democrats. And so the last 10 years, we have lived with this basically the big lie that we are democratizing, and that this is a fragile transition with Suu Kyi at its helm. Well, on Monday, the military itself killed and buried that lie. So talk about Aung San Suu Kyi's role. She's been arrested. Um, the president has been arrested. Uh, now, today, the latest news is they're being charged, I think, she, for having, they said, illegal radios, you know, gotten from abroad, finding that in her home. But the role that she has played, I mean, she was considered a freedom fighter for so long, won the Nobel Peace Prize under house arrest for so many years by the military, its chief critic. Then she became its chief spokesman person and justified um, what happened to the Rohingya um, uh, Muslims that were forced, ultimately, about a million of them, into neighboring Bangladesh. Now they have turned on her, the woman who has defended them for all these past few years? Well, you know, Amy, as you know, uh, the, the, I was a foot soldier uh, supporting her and uh, campaigning for her release. And then, you know, the, uh, 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 the divestment and boycott campaign in the U.S. for the longest time. And, uh, you know, I saw her actually at the International Court of Justice uh, in a different room when she was actually defending the military and uh, denying the charges of, uh, of genocide. And, and so it, it's really painful uh, as a dissident to see the, you know, really uh, uh, the metamorphosis, metamorphosis of Aung San Suu Kyi from this uh, the human rights defender, uh, Democrat dissident, to, you know, uh, becoming the military's defenders, the spokesperson. Two things happened. One was she miscalculated uh, that, uh, you know, if she kept on placating the military, uh, the, which her father founded uh, some 75 years ago, uh, calling the military generals her brothers, because uh, they were, she considered them her father's sons. Uh, that she thought that the military would cooperate with her to truly democratize the country and then uh, return to the barracks. Well, that proved to be wrong. And we have all, I have always said uh, that this will not work. Uh, I came from an extended military family. The, the military has no interest in democratizing the country and no commitment to democratic values whatsoever. And the second reason is she herself is an anti-Muslim racist. She shares 
the view that Rohingya Muslims do not belong in Burma. That's a view the army has institutionalized and the public has embraced. embraced. So, so Bizarni, I wanted to the... go to Aung San Suu Kyi in her own words. This yeah. was back at The Hague in 2019, defending the Burmese military's treatment of the Rohingya. Regrettably, the Gambia has placed before the court an incomplete and misleading factual picture of the situation in Rakhine State in Myanmar. Yet, it is of the utmost importance that the court assess the situation obtaining on the ground in Rakhine dispassionately and accurately. The significance of this case um, uh, in The Hague, uh, Zarni, and then what will happen to the Rohingya now with the military seizing power? Well, I think the military has institutionalized the, uh, you know, genocidal persecution of Rohingyas since 1970s. And, uh, you know, there are uh, far more Rohingyas uh, uh, dispersed across the world than Rohingyas in the country. There are about half a million Rohingyas in open-air prison camps in western Myanmar, about 120,000 in what the German officials call concentration camps. Uh, the, the rest are in, uh, you know, uh, um, these uh, vast uh, villages from where they cannot uh, leave. And then there is one million Rohingyas in Bangladesh waiting to be repatriated. We cannot, uh, uh, you know, expect uh, the perpetrators of genocide to welcome back the survivors of genocide. It is like uh, telling the Rohingya to go back to Auschwitz, uh, you know, telling the, uh, the victims of the Nazi uh, SS to go back to Auschwitz because you've got uh, new bathrooms and, you know, new paint. So the repatriation is completely off the table.